section and uh, different types of problems in computer vision so starting with classification classification with localization object detection semantic segmentation and instance instance segmentation so uh, these these were the things we discussed and we talked about the this algorithm where you would slide the windows uh, to do object detection and then we talked about okay so this is where uh, so we also talked about uh, non max suppression and uh, yolo yolo algorithm wherein we would divide the entire a uh, big image into a grid of small sub images and within those sub images we would then identify <clears throat> we would uh try to run and find out the uh object localization to find out the location of the object so you can see that and uh, in yolo we would then calculate a metric known as intersection over union which will ultimately tell us the location of the object so this was the this was the network of uh, yolo architecture and then next comes the concept of region proposals so region so rcnn so it's a, it's also it's an algorithm that also makes object detection <clears throat> and uh, so so he, so andrew talks about that yolo tells that it is faster and the model has several advantages over classifier based systems so it looks at the whole image at test time so its predictions are informed by global context in the image it also makes predictions with a single network evaluation unlike systems like rcnn which require thousands of which so which require thousands uh, for a single image and uh, this makes it extremely fast more than 1000 times faster than rcnn and 100 times faster than fast rcnn but one of the downsides of yolo is that it processes a lot of areas where there are no objects present <clears throat> now rcnn stands for re regions with convolution neural networks so that's the that's the full form of rcnn and it tries to pick a few windows and run convolution uh, neural network the confident classifier or the the robust classifier on top of on top of them so the algorithm rcnn used to, uh, uses to pick windows and it's called so it's it's used for segmentation and it outputs something like this so every pixel of the image you can see has now got a class now if for example the segmentation algorithm pr produces a 2000 blob then we should run our classifier on top of uh, or cnn on top of these blobs and there has been a lot of work regarding rnn uh, rcnns to make it faster so you propose regions classify propose regions one at a time and uh, so you would then also have the target as output label plus bounding box the downside is that it's too slow then uh, there is another algorithm known as fast rcnn <clears throat> this also uses the concept of proposal regions or proposed regions and uh, it uses convolution implementation of sliding windows to classify the pro proposed regions uh, then there is a uh, another algorithm known as faster rcnn so it uses convolution only to to identify the proposed region so that is uh, like an evolved form or version of fast rcnn and then uh, and uh, a further uh, evolution of of these uh, these type of models for segmentation is the mask rcnn we will not go into the details of of this paper you can go and check it out but if you would want to do an image segmentation for example on a satellite imagery which contains data of clouds and uh, different other uh, Dif different other uh, species you can you can image segmentation is something something you can follow and most of the implementations of rcnn still are slower than yolo 
and andre thinks that the idea behind yolo is better than rcnn because you are able to do things in just one time instead of two times so then there are other algorithms which use one shot to get the output uh, includes sst and ssd and multi box and rfcn is similar to faster rcnn but uh, more efficient and then there are different applications of of these type of algorithms so first is the face recognition system now i think by now you guys are already must be aware of the face recognition system as you use in your smartphones on daily basis and uh, so face recognition system identifies a person's face can work on both images or videos and liveness detection within the uh, within a video face recognition system prevents the network from identifying a face in an image so for example uh, you have a face recognition system uh, which wherein you have you have deployed that live for maybe for attend marking attendance and uh, somebody just comes and uh, comes and shows a picture of the person who is absent to that face recognition algorithm or camera uh, so the our system should be able to identify that uh, whether there is liveness or not in the in the in the image or in the input and it can be learned by supervised deep learning using a data set for live human and in live human and sequence learning so you can <clears throat> you can use video based algorithms to to perform uh, to to develop such kind of algorithm and uh, so then there is uh, there are two other types of problems known as face verification versus face recognition now in verification you have an input which is an image and uh, it has got a name or an id and the output is whether the input image is of the claimed person or not <clears throat> so the this is this is about verification so it can you can just show an image to a to the system and it it has to find out whether that person exists in the database or not so this can be used for like it is also actually being used for uh, for example you would you would use your id card to scan and to open the gates or uh, in in some in some institutions so then we have the face recognition system now it has a database of eight persons you get the system gets an input image output id if the image is any of the k persons and also who is that person so that is that is uh, the recognition problem so we need to know who actually that person is so so that uh, proper recognition can be done and <clears throat> when we can use a face uh, verification system to make a face recognition system and the accuracy has to be high uh, somewhere around greater than 99.9% to to be used accurately within a recognition system because the recognition system accuracy will be less than the verification system so then comes the <clears throat> then comes yeah okay so then comes the concept of one shot learning and uh, one shot learning is uh, so you you have one of the face recognition challenges is to solve one shot learning problems it is like in one go you have to you have to recognize uh, recognize a person so just learning from one image so is that is that is basically known as one shot learning the recognition system is able to recognize a person learning from only one image and historically deep learning doesn't work well with a small amount of data so instead to make this work we will learn a similarity function so similarity function this is d uh, which gets an input img1 and img2 and uh, you output the degree of difference between the two images so we want d uh, result to be low in the case of small same faces and uh, we 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 would we would use the tau t as threshold for d so the so the this similarity function between the image 1 and image 2 should be less than or equal to tau and if it is if it is such that uh, the the similarity function is less than tau then you classify that the uh, faces are the are the same and similarity functions help us solve the one shot learning problem so so now if you if you develop such such an algorithm uh, where where you do uh, where you have this kind of similarity function you can so in in the in the training data set you just have one input 
so like for a particular label you just have one image so that is the one shot learning problem and how you would do that is using a siamese network so this is this is the siamese network so so you you implement the similarity function using a type of neural network called siamese network in which we pass multiple inputs to the two or more networks with the same architecture and parameters so in this siamese network you can see that you are passing two images so first image x1 is of this boy and the second image x2 is of is of a girl and you pass this image to the siamese network so first is a convolution 2d convolution 2d and then you have a fully connected layer and then you get a 128 vector output or tensor 128 tensor output so you can call this this as fx1 this is fx2 so the similarity function between these two will be the modulus of like your square you take the difference of these two and take a square of that uh, square of like you the the modulus and then so we make two identical convolution neural network which encodes an input image into the vector so in the in the in, in the above image the vector shape is 128 loss function is d x1 x2 which is you take you take the difference of these two uh, outputs and if x1 and x2 are the same person we want d to be low so if they are different persons we want d to be high so that is that is how you you would uh, you would you so if it is of the so you can think of this in uh, in this way that if so this this network weights are same they are they are shared so so uh, you can you can see that that is what how that is that is how they define the siamese network so in which you can pass multiple inputs to two or more network with the same architecture and parameters so here the point to be noted is that the this these two networks they have the same architecture and the same network so if you will pass the same image to the same architecture and the same network you will get same outputs or or maybe similar outputs right and then if you take the difference of those two the loss function the similarity function will be low so and then you can say that this is uh, like this so you can you can you can do the you can do one shot learning problem wherein if you have just one label for a single image so you can you can train it using siamese network and perform one shot learning now there is another uh, loss which is known as the triplet loss so triplet loss is one of the loss functions we can use to solve the similarity distance in a similar sim siamese network and our learning objective in the triplet loss function is to get the distance between the anchor image and a positive or negative image so positive means the same person and uh, negative means that it's a different person so in this kind of in this kind of uh, and with this kind of an input so your uh, your you you will get you will get a you will get the distance as negative and uh, if if you pass the same images then it will then it will be positive so the triplet name came from that we are comparing an anchor a with positive p and a negative n image so formally if you if you want to see this so if you have if you have an anchor a and uh, a f a minus f p square so which is which should be less than or equal to f a minus f n square so and then if you if you bring this if you bring the rhs of to the to to the left side so then you can see it becomes f a minus f p square like modulus in square minus f a minus f n modulus square and uh, so if you so generally it, it won't be like near zero so we would use a hyperparameter alpha yeah so so we would we would use a hyperparameter alpha which is a small a small number also known as the margin so finally you can see that the loss function final loss function is such that you are, if you are given three images which is one is anchor another is p which is positive and another is n which is negative so the loss function becomes something like this l of a p and n and uh, so you you find out the maximum between the so you this this is the loss so this number plus alpha comma 0 and uh, so then you would find out the you would find out the summation for all the images and you will try to minimize the minimize the cost so to so the way to choose these triplets is that if if 
during training if a p and n are chosen randomly then one of the problems is like uh, this constraint is so is so d of a comma p plus alpha uh, would be less than d of a comma n so d here is our similarity function uh, the problem is that the neural network won't learn much and uh, so what do what we want to do is that choose triplets that are hard to train on so for all the triplets we want uh, what we want to be satisfied is that d of a comma p plus alpha should be so this can be i think is written as the same thing okay yeah so this the details are uh, yeah i think this there is, there is some some issue with like uh, like these two are are, are same yeah so they, they like there there was a there's a difference between so how you would basically train the or how would you would uh, generate the triplets so that you can perform this kind of one shot learning and then comes the difference between face verification and binary classification so he says that triplet loss is one way to learn the parameters of a convolute for face recognition and there is another way to learn the parameters as a straight binary classification problem so for example learning the similarity function we can we can also do something like from these two from these two 128 uh, sized vectors we can input them to a to to a neuron and then which can give us a sigmoid uh, sigmoid uh, a classification so you can you can you can also do this and so this so this is the so tigman at all 2014 discuss uh, discuss this technique and uh, then comes the concept of neural style transfer so a neural style transfer is also an application of the convolution neural networks so you have a content you have a style and you have a generated image so it basically you you would uh, it it trans so neural style transfer takes content image c style image s and generates the content image g with a style of the same image so this style s is to be applied to the content c and uh, so you can see that it is it is being applied here and in order to implement this you you need to look at the features extracted by connet at the shallow and deep layers so it uses a previously trained network convolution neural network like vgg and builds on top of that so the idea of using a network trained on a different task and applying it to a new task we have already seen is known as transfer learning so what is it that the what is it that the connets are learning so i think we have already discussed this paper zeiler and fergus so for example you are you have this image and 224 cross 224 cross 3 you pass it through uh, you pass it through this this network uh, which is having an architecture like alexnet and then you pick a unit in the layer l so you pick you pick the uh, a particular layer and then you try to plot plot these layers so when you try to plot these layers and uh, so you will get something like this so these ones you can see these are these are so for the layer 1 the size of the filter is 3 by 3 and you have nine filters here which are plotted so and similarly this is layer 2 which also has uh, they are showing nine plotted filters layer 3 layer 4 layer 5 so you can see that the first initial uh, layers so first layer it try it tries to identify the 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 edges the second layer tries to tries to identify slightly more non linear features like curves and the last layer is actually trying to directly identify the faces so that is what that is what is being done in this convolution neural networks and this is a classical paper that yeah that you should go back and see visualizing and understanding convolution neural networks yeah this is from zeiler and fergus and uh, okay so so then he discusses the cost function uh, between okay so this is i think for for the for the neural neural style transfer this we will see in the when we are discussing gans and uh, so you can also just like you can also uh, do 3d convolutions or 1d convolutions and then you have yeah we are already seeing keras and tensor flow so 
this was a big big course and uh, we have seen a lot of material from this so what we will do is we will we will go to the we'll go to hands on and if you guys have anything to discuss uh, in cnns we can discuss that now or i will go to the i think we did this basic classification we already did m fashion mnist am i audible am I, am i audible yes sir okay so yeah i mean we have if you have any questions in cnn i know it was a long uh, this was a long course and uh, so you can you we can we can discuss that now or maybe later also so now we will we will do some some exercises so this we have already seen this is the fashion amnist then we will see the okay test text classification we will do we decided we will do when we go to the text sequence models so we have okay we have the convolution neural network here okay we will just quickly maybe go through again through this uh, through this example of cnn and uh, so you can see that this okay so this this tutorial is for cnn to classify cfr images uses the keras sequential api and uh, so we will we will import tensorflow as tf and from tensorflow.keras we will do ten, import data sets comma layers comma models and uh, then you can see that okay so we are also getting the matplotlib dot pyplot so then you can see that uh, this cfr dataset it comes as a part of as a part of tensorflow so you can load the training images train labels test images and test labels from this uh, from this dataset class and uh, you can get this load data function from the cfr 10 class so cfr is a uh, yeah, CIFR, these are the CIFR images wherein you have these images and then uh, you have these labels. So you have to basically, it's an it's a image classification problem. And uh, so these are, the, these are the names of the, of the classes. You would first see how to plot these, how to plot these images and uh, just visualize, have a, have a, uh, understanding basic understanding of how these these images are looking and then you would start creating your convolution neural network so this these six lines you can see that these are uh, this is your cnn model so we are using the sequential api in this one we have two types of api sequential and functional so we would say so this models a model is a is an object of the class models dot sequential and we would add this layer so layers was from the keras dot so tensorflow dot keras dot layers so this is coming from there and you would see we we add a layer to this model and that layer is a con 2d with 32 filters and a kernel size of three by three and the activation function is relu the input shape also you have to provide. So in this case, it is 32 by 32 by three for us. And then we would do max pooling with the, with the, with the filter size of two and the stride of two. And uh, then con 2D again with the 64 filters, kernel size as three by three activation again, relu. And then again, max pooling and then con 2D. So this model, you can see the summary of this model by using this syntax model dot summary. So you can you can see it like this. So model dot model dot summary, and uh, so you can see that after that we so until now our model has uh, it started from a con two D layer and ended at con two D. So then you can see that we added the dense layer on top of it 
so we say model dot add layer dot layer dot flatten so we flatten this this 2d layer uh and then you add a dense layer to it with 64 neurons and another dense layer with uh, which is the output which has got 10 neurons so because we have 10 classes and then you define the optimizer so optimizer we want as adam the loss function is sparse categorical cross entropy and the metrics so you can you can save the you can save the log in this history variable and then you can say model dot fit train images comma train levels comma the number of epochs you want to run this on and then uh, validation data so this validation data is something that the model has not seen so you can see that the validation loss is uh, around 0.8475 validation accuracy is 0.7192 and uh, so you can also plot uh, plot these uh, plot plot the accuracy uh, for training data and for the validation data set uh, with the with the epochs and you can see that it is 0 0.7192 so this example we have already seen a couple of times before now this tutorial this is a second tutorial it shows uh, how to classify images of flowers it creates an image classifier using tf.keras.sequential, loads the data using tf.keras.utils image dataset from directory. So you can see that this is this is a slightly more realistic example, like uh, your an example which you can um, you can even replace this with your own dataset. So we have we have different types of flowers now. And uh, these are the flowers, daisy, dandelion, roses, sunflower, and tulips. So you, you first of all, you load the, you load the data set. So you, the data set is on this. Is there a question? Okay, so. Okay, so the data set is in this data you and data set underscore URL. So you first of all you get the image count. So the length of this list of these data sets. So this data directory will contain the list of all the all the uh, like files. So we have three six seven zero images, and uh, then you can also then uh, you can try to load a particular image for example roses uh, you can get as you can get it as a list of of the of the paths so data underscore dir which you which you take from here and uh, that so the, you can see that these are uh, these are the these are the directories so you, you load all the all the paths and using the pil library so you plot the first first image. This is the first image. This is the second image, and then if you want to see some tulips, and this is another set of I don't know what it is called tulips or tulips. So then you define a batch size, uh, which is 32. The size of image is 180. Width of images 180. So previously, you see, we were using the size of image as 32 cross 32 cross 3. Here, our image size has increased. And uh, so for for image data sets, there is this standard Keras uh, utility image data set from directory. So you can see we give we have to give the data directory path the validation split. So we give 20% of the data for validation and uh, so this this is our we perform training and uh, we give a seed so that uh, every time so that the results are reproducible and you have to give image size which is uh, which is a tuple of image height comma image width and the batch size so then it would it would uh, print something like this found three seven three six seven zero files belonging to five classes and using two nine three six files for training now you can also so you will also create a validation data set so you will say that okay the subset is here is validation the rest everything remains the same 
So here it will tell you print the same message, but now 734 files for validation. So the class names, so you can so you can get it from uh, train underscore ds dot class names. So we have these five classes and you can also visualize the data. So you can say train underscore ds dot take one and uh, for for images comma labels. So you you basically extract one one image and then for I in range uh, so zero to nine. So you create you create this uh, uh, subplot of like size three by three subplot you create and uh, you plot this you plot the the first so you plot the images from here so you take one basically means that it will take one batch of of the images so your batch size is 32 so that means take one has extracted 32 images and uh, those out of those 32 images you are plotting the first nine in this uh in this sub in these subplots which is a three by three uh in in this kind of a three by three grid and you can see what is the what is the shape of these uh the inputs and the labels so for image batch comma labels batch in train underscore ds so if you print the image batch dot shape you will get 32 by 180 by 180 by 3 and if you print the labels batch dot shape you will get 32 so you have basically these 32 images of size 180 by 180 by 3 and they have 32 labels so the image batch is a tensor of shape 32 comma 32 comma 32 comma 180 comma 180 by comma 3 so batch of 32 images of shape 180 cross 180 cross 3 label, label by batch is the tensor of shape 32 and these are corresponding to 32 images so you can call numpy on the image batch and labels batch tensors to convert them into numpy nd array so now you uh, so we will see how to configure the data set for performance so let's make sure to use buffered prefetching so that uh, so you can yield data from disk without having io so without blocking your io and uh, there are so these are two important methods you should know when uh, when loading data so the first is dataset dot cache so dataset dot cache it keeps the images in memory after they are loaded off disk during the first epoch so this will ensure that the data set does not become a bottleneck while training your model so if your data set is too large to fit into memory you can use this method to create a, per, a performant on uh, the disk cache so then every time you don't have to uh, so it it is it's it's useful if you are if you are if you are using large data set and that data set is loaded in cache or uh, which is a buffer memory and then the another function is dataset.prefetch so it overlaps data pre-processing and model execution while uh, while training. So this this prefetch is very useful because pre-processing takes a, a lot of chunk of your time and uh, and effort. So if you can if you if you use this dot dot prefetch, you can overlap data pre-processing and model execution. And uh, so they're saying that interested readers can learn more about these methods and as and as well as how to cache data to the disk in the prefetching section of the better performance with the TF dot data guide. Okay, so now we will see that we will uh, extract, we will make an object of from this class auto tune, which is defined in the class data. So we have this uh, object auto tune. And uh, so the train data set, we say train data set uh, train underscore ds dot cache dot shuffle thousand. So this will shuffle it thousand times and then dot prefetch buffer size equal to auto tune. And uh, similarly, we will also uh, apply the cache function and the prefetch to the validation data set. Now the next thing is that you have to normalize the data. So or standardize the data. So this one is an image data set. So you would scale it by divide it by 120 uh, by 255. Your data set, you would basically compute the max value and then you will divide it by max. And uh, then you can apply this normalization layer. 
to the entire train underscore ds. So you would say train underscore ds dot map. You have to first give the mapping function lambda x comma y. So you basically have these as the parameters x and y. And uh, so what what it is what it will output you is basically you will get this normalization layer x and uh, comma y. So this is so the y is our our labels. Uh, which is also a part of this train ds and uh, this x is the are the inputs so you would apply in this case they are applying normalization over x and returning y as it is so then image batch comma label batch equal to next so in the so in the next iteration so if you are iterating it once going in the next step and then taking one batch of images and the labels and uh, then you are saying for example the first image is equal to image batch 0 and then you are just printing if you just print the minimum and the maximum of this first image which is the out of so this image batch will be having 32 i think 32 right what is the batch size here yeah i think we gave as 32 yeah so the batch size is 32 we are passing it here in train ds so you will you will basically yeah, so so that so this image batch is is uh, is consists of thirty two images, and if you just print the min and max value, so that is zero and one. So what or you can include the layer inside the model definition. So you can what what is saying is that you can include this normalization within the model. So it's it's something like this. So you are you have model equal to sequential and then layers dot rescaling so you add this rescaling layer within the like as a part of the as a part of the model and uh, then you have so this takes an image and the outputs the uh, output is the number of neurons which is equal to the number of classes and then we compile the model so in compilation we will use the optimizer we are using adam and uh, we define the loss and the metrics so metrics is just for just for monitoring the model A model will not get optimized on these on this metric and then you print model dot summary which will tell you about uh, what is there in the model and uh, you basically perform training so for example we say epox equal to 10 history equal to model dot fit train ds comma validation data equal to val ds and epoch equal to epoch. So you don't have to give train x, train y, and uh, the x train y train and uh, x x test y test. So then uh, you 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 see we 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 saved the logs in this history. So we said history equal to model dot fit, and then you can extract the different parameters from this history. So you can say accuracy equal to history dot history accuracy and the validation accuracy equal to history dot history validation val underscore accuracy and the loss loss also you can extract and the validation loss also so these were the metrics you were you were tracking if you remember in uh, in this compilation we had the loss and the metrics uh, which was accuracy and then the epoch range so that that will be the range of like uh, all the all the epochs so how many how many epochs are there so you can see on x axis you have the training and validation accuracy and y and on this in this plot you have the training and validation loss so our model is overfitting as you can see that training accuracy is going somewhere around one our validation it has flattened out and our loss is also so this validation loss is now going up and uh, but training loss is decreased to almost zero so this is how we will identify that the model has overfitted and uh, this is a sign of overfitting and where when there are small uh, numbers of training examples the model sometimes learns from noises or unwanted details from training examples to an extent that it negatively affects the performance of the model and uh, there are multiple ways to fight ways to fight overfitting uh, and uh, in this tutorial so they are showing data augmentation and dropout so we have already discussed about data augmentation so in data augmentation 
you would uh, you would basically it it takes the approach of generalizing so it, you create additional training data from your existing examples by augmenting them using random transformation that yield believable looking images so either you would do something like random flip you would rotate you would do random zoom so this is this is an example of uh, data augmentation so you would create a data augmentation uh, data augmentation layers so we have so we build this also using keras dot sequential so you first flip it randomly so you say you say layers dot random flip uh, you flip it horizontally and then you do random rotation and then random zoom so you can see that so these are like uh, the the from the training from the training data you you take you fetch one one batch and then for that uh, for that particular batch so you would you would do the augmentation so you would perform data augmentation uh, over the images over all the 32 images and then you plot the first uh, so augmented first nine augmented images so this is the these are the these are the outputs of the data augmentation as it looks like and then another technique that we already discussed is dropout. So you can see that you, so he added data augmentation here and then rescaling, con 2D max pooling, con 2D max pooling, con 2D max pooling, dropout. So you, after this max pooling layer, you have this dropout. So basically uh, you are, you are skipping or you are just uh, cutting down 20% of the connections. And uh, that too, randomly so then after this if you compile the model using this adam optimizer and uh, and adam optimizer and uh, the the sparse categorical cross cross entropy loss so the we have the same metrics and uh, then you try to visualize your uh, your accuracy so you can see now that the validation is also accuracy is increasing loss is decreasing so that means the data augmentation and dropout have helped and uh, you can also predict on the new data set so you can just take an example of a data which the model has not seen and uh, you can you can try to predict so you you say sunflower path so you can bring uh, an image a jpg image you can even click from your phone and then you load this you load this image so you create a tensorflow tensor uh, from this from this image and then you say so the image array is a uh, so you you create a batch uh, batch of this input array uh, and then you so the you create the you, then you generate the predictions so predictions equal to mod, model dot predict image array and then you you for for the for the predictions so you generate the softmax classification. So then after doing that, so you say uh, you can print this image is most likely most likely belongs to uh, so the class names uh, which corresponds to the maximum value of this score. So np dot arcmax score, and then uh, it will print the class name which corresponds to the maximum value of the score, which is the probability of the predicted class and. Uh, comma 100 into np dot max score so this image is most like most likely belongs to sunflowers with an 80 with a 89.13 percent confidence so you can see that we have seen a real example of uh, data augmentation and dropout and how they can uh, they can basically help you in in improving the model accuracy so we will we will continue from the from the next class and uh, 